at home, around the world. I'm Stephen Lim, and I'm here with Tom Glasgow, Chief Investment Officer Asia of Omni Bridgeway, one of the pioneer arbitration and litigation funders in the Asia-Pacific region. I'm recording my seventh episode for 39SX at Home Around the World series, which we began in the midst of the worldwide lockdown in the first half of 2020. Thanks for joining me today, Tom. Uh, pleasure. Nice to be here, Stephen. We're not locked down in Singapore now more than a year down the road, but are still largely at home. To paraphrase Singapore's health minister, we're in the midst of a critical few weeks as the country allows infection rates to rise rapidly, relying mainly on vaccination as a defense as we move to living with COVID as an endemic disease. We're going to discuss a few topics today from the third party's funders' point of view. These are confidentiality, transparency, and predicting results in arbitration and mediation as a risk management tool. The idea for this episode came to me when, Tom, you and I had the pleasure of debating the importance of confidentiality and transparency in international arbitration across each other at the AIAC conference about a month ago. And as we were discussing these topics, it struck me that funders may have a different view on confidentiality and transparency. Uh, In some ways, confidentiality and transparency might be positive for funders. Is that true, Tom? Well, I I think um, in some circumstances, uh, parties do like confidentiality in uh, in arbitration proceedings, and and indeed that's why they choose uh, arbitration. Um, But for us as funders, the main thing that we're always focused on, and you mentioned this in your introduction, uh, is the pre- predictability um, of, of an outcome. And uh, there is a view that decision makers uh, may make better decisions in circumstances where uh, their decisions are, are transparent and their decision-making process is more transparent and perhaps the, the, the procedure in the arbitration is, is more transparent. Uh, and so in, in that sense, we do uh, think there is benefit um, to having transparency in, in international arbitration. And it sort of ties in with the idea of uh, having appeals in arbitration, which is you know, often a subject um, of, of debate. But essentially, the, the idea is that uh, if arbitrators sitting uh, on their own or, or as a group um, have the sense that uh, their decision will be scrutinised uh, by people in the public, um, then they may be care- more careful about um, how they approach things. Um, I think as a, as a general rule, um, you know, international arbitration where you've got sophisticated parties involved and a, and a good tribunal involved, um, you should expect you know, a robust and, and legally sound outcome. Um, but those of us that have been involved in the industry for long enough know that, that sometimes that's not the case um, and you do get... Uh, strange, you know, rogue decisions. You do sometimes uh, get the appearance of of decisions reflecting trade offs between arbitrators, perhaps compromise and in, in, with the intent of, of reaching a unanimous uh, decision. Um, and, and and maybe that wouldn't happen so much if there was a bit more transparency uh, around it. Um, and you know, the the outcome of of the arbitration is absolutely critical to us. Um, and not just whether it's successful or, or not successful, but uh, other elements which are potentially uh, linked to, to more discretion, like damages um, or costs, you know, they're very important to the economics of an investment. Um, and if there is some trading off in, in, in those things, it may, may have a significant impact on, on us. Um, similarly, the length of time that something takes, um, you know, if the procedure is not run efficiently, uh, it can really affect uh, our investment returns. Um, you know, if the cost of, of the process is increased, um, that can can affect our, our returns as well. Um, you know, for example, if a tribunal orders you know, two rounds of, of post-hearing uh, briefs because they want to give the parties a chance to be heard, um, you know, that may cost the parties an extra half a million dollars or a million dollars between them, depending on the complexity of the case. And, you know, sometimes that's not taken into account. Um, again, more transparency around this sort of thing might allow 
parties to um, to to have a view on how a process might be conducted before they appoint um, arbitrators. That's some of the the, the thinking behind it. Uh, what do you what do you mean, Tom, when you when you say that more transparency might be beneficial for the process? What do you, are you thinking of of making all arbitration hearings as public as as court hearings, or or something something less than that? You you probably don't have to go that far. Um, you know, there there is a world I think where uh, you know you can have elements of confidentiality and transparency um, at the same time. Um, you know, perhaps there is a way to pub publicize the length of, of proceedings uh, and maybe some institutions already do that um, but I think it's important to to link that to who's on the tribunal so the parties know that if they're going to appoint a certain arbitrator or a set of arbitrators then you know it might have this impact on the, on the length of proceedings um, and of course there's nuances and complexities and why things take as long as they take um, and you know but I think that kind of information is useful for parties in, in, in making decisions. Um, you, you could look to um, uh, uh, make more awards available on an anonymised basis um, so that parties can see how tribunals and arbitrators approach certain issues. Um, and you know, the, the award will set out the procedure, so that gives you more insight into the procedure as well. Uh, one thing you said that struck me, but, but I think it, it's already inbuilt uh, in the process, at, at least you know, from my perspective, as someone who sits as an arbitrator as well, which is that, you know, my decision might be, I, I wouldn't want to say um, more careful or more diligent, because I like to think that I'm always careful and diligent with my decision making, but that I would, I, it would, it would matter to me that it is being scrutinized um, by, by others. And, and already in the present process, I think it is, because it is, it is being scrutinized by the council that appear before me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, I would hope that it, it may not be the only time that, <laughs> that, that these council would, would appear before me. And also it would be scrutinized by the institution when there's an institution involved. There will be a, a case council, or sometimes if you're talking about the ICC, it would be the court that scrutinizes an award. So there is scrutiny already uh, inbuilt into the current process. And I, I feel you know, uh, that there are enough eyes already watching what I'm doing <laughs> that you know, without, without the public getting involved, uh, it matters to me what, what the council think about the quality of the decision at the end of the day. It matters to me what the institution thinks about the quality of decision at the end of the day. So you know, from the funder's point of view, do, do, you, do you think that's enough or do you think there's, there's still more um, in your experience that, that could be done to, to increase this accountability? Well, you know, I, 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 I do think that a lot of arbitrators probably are like you, Stephen, that, you know, they, they um, feel compelled to, to do the best job that they can um, and, you know, under the scrutiny of, of their colleagues in, in the industry. And that probably does have have an impact. Um, and you know, council have um, you know, council that are working in the international arbitration space do have a good view of you know how arbitrators perform and, and who's suitable for what what sorts of cases. Um, but parties don't; they have less um, less of a view on, on that. And you're sort of beholden then to your uh, council's um, advice on that that type of thing. And, and we all know that in the arbitration world. Um, you know, council says arbitrators, arbitrators says council, and there may be other factors involved in, in appointment of arbitrators in some situations. Um, and I think it's better to have that transparency that parties can see for themselves, okay, this arbitrator decides issues in this way or, um, you know, has, has conducted procedure in, in, in this way. Um, and, and then, you know, thinking about the institutional scrutiny, um, I do think that's very valuable. Um, I, I think you do see better quality awards where there's institutional um, scrutiny, and, and even if it creates a little bit of delay, I think that's a that's a good thing. Um, but they're typically looking at you know issues that might impact on the enforceability of the award, um, and that's that's not going to the merits of the case or the um, the, the, the credibility of the reasoning um, or the diligence of the of, of the process that the, the arbitrators have gone through in reaching their conclusions. It's more about was there a fair um, 
opportunity given to either side and you know, has everything been recorded in the award and, and you know, are there any errors um, that need to be picked up. So it only goes so far. Um, you know, I think we do rely a lot on um, the, the individual discipline of, of arbitrators. And as I say, you expect most people in, in, in the space who have a, you know, a good reputation and have a, you know, a degree of experience that they will do a good job. Um, uh, but, you know, that occasionally there are um, odd outcomes. And if you had transparency, maybe that would be reduced. Um, you know, if you had the ability to appeal uh, from our perspective, it would it, it would give you more of a chance to reach that the, the right outcome, the, the predictable um, outcome. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, lawyers tend to advise on on the strength of arguments, you know, whereas we're trying to really predict what the outcome is going to be. And, and as we all know, so much more goes into a decision um, than just the legal arguments. Um, you know, it's how the individual sees things, the, the, the strength of the advocacy, how witnesses perform, um, you know, how the three members on the tribunal might interact with each other, um, what their individual views are, the strength of their personalities vis-a-vis -vis each other, um, all, all goes into that. Um, and if you, you know, maybe if you had another layer, another opportunity to test um, the issues, it would, it would ensure that you, you get to the right outcome eventually. Well, you, you mentioned appeals, and I, and I think we should talk about that. I want to come back to that. But you've also said a few other things, which I think are quite interesting to pick up on. Um, one is uh, you talk, you, you spoke about how it's good to have a picture of how an arbitrator decides things. You know, what's his demeanor, what's his approach, uh, you know, more than just the, the the hard nuts and bolts of of the legal merit. So you've got now some resources like arbitrator intelligence that that tries to gather this information does, does that does that help funders do you know do you use arbitrator intelligence when, when selecting an arbitrator it, it it's very interesting um it, arbitrator intelligence it, it's interesting data and um, you'd have to think that um you know elements of it are subjective you know gathered from users and 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 counsel after after the process and um, and and so that you know that sort of information is is interesting and there are um some machine learning tools um that are being developed looking at the way that arbitrators um make decisions and um, we had an interesting uh, example recently well, well a few years ago now um we we lost a case uh, and uh, we were speaking with uh, one of these people developing um, this AI technology and, and essentially running machine learning across um, the body of arbitral decisions that are in the public domain and, and how tribunals make, make those decisions. Um, and they were able to tell us that with, with the tribunal that we had um, on the issue we lost on, we had a, you know, a, a less than 50% chance of being successful on that issue. But if we had chosen a different claimant nominee and, and, and chosen one of five other arbitrators, we could have increased the prospects of success over 70%. Um, and you know, it's interesting. It is interesting. And I, I don't know how accurate um, it is, but that kind of data-driven analysis, I think, um, will only become more useful. Um, and, and maybe it will draw on the type of data that, that arbitrator intelligence has, has been pulling together. Um, but it, you know, it, it won't replace the, the human-driven um, assessment of you know, what's this case we've got, what are the issues in this case, um, you know, who are the parties, how the witness is going to perform, what are the arguments, and, and who are our three arbitrators and how do they, they interact with each other and what decision might they make on the day. Um, you're always going to have to have a human element to that that assessment, I think. Well, what you mentioned about the the machine learning uh, process sounded very, very interesting. I've not quite heard of that. Do you know what factors they take in consideration that would that would make a difference between arbitrator A, B, and C? Yeah, it's it's the way that they've decided past issues, um, and then also taking into account whether they've been appointed by the party or whether they're um, chairperson. Um, and uh, and beyond that, I don't know. That's that's to the wizards of, of AI and the people that are building the, the program. Um, but I thought you know it was a very interesting example. 
Hmm. Well, uh, let, let me play devil's advocate a little bit and come back to another point that you've made that it, it would help if the parties themselves had access to how arbitrators decide cases and, and how they manage cases. Um, and publishing awards may, may be one of these factors, but let me postulate something and get your reaction to it, which would be like, oh, in court cases, you will really get published judgments and, and any if it's a if it's a court hearing, open court hearing, anybody can go and sit and and watch. How many parties do you know would actually read court cases and actually go and attend a court case? That's not that's not their own. Uh, and and how much? You know, and if they don't do that, then presumably they're still relying on on their counsel's advice as to the merits of the case or what what this particular judge may be like. So is that going to be so different from what you have now? Uh, in the arbitration world, where I think counsel have a pretty good view of known arbitrators. You, as a funder as well, probably have your own view of known arbitrators. Uh, and you can advise the parties that that you're dealing with. Counsel can advise advise the clients that, that they're representing about you know, who might be an appropriate candidate. Are we that you know, different, you know, that far from what you want? Uh, already a, a, as things stand well you know I, I i think i think it's only down to individuals experience um because of the private nature of it um you know council might have had experience with one um arbitrator in, in one matter so that you know that, but they won't have, be able to have access to how that arbitrator has dealt with other cases or how they might have interacted uh, with other um arbitrators and that's the kind of insight that I think you would get from from broader access to it. I don't think any party is going to go and and, and sit there and watch hearings. Um, you know, more my experience in um, civil litigation has been in empty courtrooms. The public galleries are seldom uh, full in the matters that I've been involved in. But um, you know, you at least have access to the, to the decisions, um, and and that does say a lot. I think about. Um, about the way that a tribunal might approach certain issues. Right. Let, let's move on to, to the interesting uh, topic of appeals. Now, you've mentioned it a few times, so we, we can't we can't go <laughs> leave it uh, you know, with, without turning it over. So I, I, from what you said, it sounds like you are in favor of having appeals in, in arbitration. Well, it, it's a trade-off, um, you know, and, and I think if you do have appeals, it's got to be in in, in the right way. Um, and, and the trade-off is in terms of additional time and, and cost, really. You know, um, appeals are probably um, best for the losing party. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it would be useful to have it there uh, as, as a check and balance if, if a case has gone off the rails for, for whatever reason. Um, but then you're going to want that appeal to be able to um, look not just at the process, but the you know the merits of of, of the case, and um, you know maybe not just the law, but you know the factual findings as well. Um, but you you're not going to want that to be another necessarily private black box environment either, because you you, know, you still don't have that that sort of transparency, um, and and you've got to be careful. You you wouldn't want the the, the uh, arbitrator sitting on the appeal. Um, to you know, feel beholden to the decision that's made below, and, and you know, in, in the arbitration world, as we know, it's you know there are a lot of relationships, and um, and uh, you've got to be careful with that. So, if you are going to have an appeal, um, it, it, to keep it low cost, to keep it you know one separation away from from the world of arbitration, and um, you know something like the SICC, I think, is 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 possibly a good solution. Um, you, you get a, a more transparent process, you get a, a lower cost process, um, something that would hopefully be able to run fairly efficiently um, and, and be able to look at the merits potentially and, and the outcome and, and um, make a decision. That, that would be interesting, I think. Well, th there's no model for that, uh, as you know now in the mm. arbitration world. I mean, you you possibly in some jurisdictions get a limited right of appeal on a point of law, mm. but it's not as wide as, as what you were talking about because yeah. it's only on certain points of law mm. uh, and that then the restrictions on on being able to take up that point of law to begin with. Mm. Um, 
So there's definitely nothing in the arbitration world right now which would allow uh, an appeal appellate tribunal to look into the facts of the case uh, and whether factual determinations have been made correctly. There's, there's nothing, there's no analogy to that. Maybe the closest to it might be in the investment ar- arbitration treaty world. Mm. Um, where you have an uh, an, an exit uh, tribunal that 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 would look at that, um, so you know, for us to get there, it seems it's 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 going to be quite a big step. Uh, yeah, it, it would it would be a, an enormous step, and I, I I don't think it will happen. Um, I think it's an interesting thing to postulate about, but um, you know, if if you think of it from the party's perspective, they're very interested in in finality. You know, that's a that's a major reason why people use arbitration. You have one one shot, one set of proceedings, and it, and then it's dealt with. Um, from our perspective, we're we're quite happy with finality so long as it's the right outcome, and that's why, um, you know, we quite like having uh, the, a, a, an appeal in reserve potentially. Um, but it it's I don't think likely to to happen, um, at least not in the broad terms that I've I've been describing. And so that, you know, what that means is that we just have to look at arbitration in a different way, um, and we do. We, you know, we apply a different risk profile to arbitration. Um, you, you know, you, you have to weigh up very carefully um, the, the the tribunal and, and how they might look at things. Um, and uh, you know, we price things differently in, in arbitration as well because you, you, it's much more binary. You get one shot. Um, and uh, and it is higher risk. Well, that 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 sounds like we're leading into it. I want you know I would think a very interesting topic for me, which is how funders go about actually doing their pricing and and predicting results and and weighing that the 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 risk when taking on a case. But just before we do that, you mentioned one thing which, which I'd like to pick up on as well, which is that you 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 put the SICC up there as a good example. Commercial courts is a good good example of the the sort of of appeal that you think might might help in ensuring that one gets uh, the right result or a good result um, on, on the merits. Does that mean, and given what we've discussed about how right now we're just too far away from, even though there's been discussion at times about introducing an, an, an appellate process and arbitration or, uh, in some form, we're just too far away from that, that, that realistically we can't think that anything is going to happen on that pretty soon. So does that mean that you, in some cases, might try and, uh, you know, I, either would you advocate going to commercial courts rather than arbitration? Or if you get a case, maybe, that could go, you know, it's hard to think of one that could go either way. But, you know, if you had to, if you had the ability to influence it, would you would you say that a party would be better off going to the commercial court than, than in arbitration? Well, you'd have to weigh up. All of the, the the pros and cons of that, and that's probably a whole whole another discussion. But I think that one of the key things we would think about um, is enforceability. Um, so you, you, you know, it, it's always a trade off. And you know, in arbitration, it, it's a private process. You don't have an appeal, etc. But you do have uh, what is currently um, the most effective tool for um, multi jurisdictional enforcement. Um, and, and, you know, the SICC, for example, um, the, the enforcement uh, framework around that has been improving. Uh, and, you know, there are a number of jurisdictions where you could take a decision from that court and, and enforce it. So it would probably depend where we thought we were going to have to go um, and enforce if we thought we were going to have to enforce. Uh, but if all things were being equal on that that front, then I think, you know, we probably would opt for the more transparent procedure um, with an appeal, because you know, for all of the reasons that, that we've been discussing, it just it suits us better, and um, we think it means that we can predict the outcomes better. And if we get it wrong at first instance, we get another chance um, to get the outcome that we want. Right. That, so I think we're, we've come, you know, right to the to to the to that you know that that door front of predicting results <laughs> uh, and i'd like to open that door and try and get an insight into into your world as to how you go go about doing that you know as, as a lawyer i think as you know uh, it's commonly you know, said amongst all counsel that no counsel would ever give a client a a, a percentage uh, you know likelihood of success um so how how do you 
uh, as a funder, take that beyond that and and get comfort with with taking on a case uh, and thinking that this is one which you're much more likely to win than than to lose. Yeah, I, I think we do take a much more holistic approach to it. And, you know, we of course we look at the the, the legal merits, um, but we also try and and put our shoes ourselves in the shoes of the decision maker. Um, you know, how are they going to to see this? What is the backstory behind it all? How are the parties going to to be perceived? Um, as well as what is you know what are the legal arguments? Um, because I think you know in international arbitration or in the court system, you have highly intelligent decision makers that can retrofit a legal argument to reach an outcome that they want at the end of the day if they want to. Um, and so we we, you know, we we very much take that into account. And, and you know, in, in our process, we we work um, very collaboratively with with the lawyers and in, in looking at the case theory and understanding their their strategy. We spend a lot of time with the clients and um, trying to understand the backstory um, because that all comes out at a hearing. And um, you know, that the, the, the tribunal will get a sense of who they are and and and, and how they 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 behaved. And, and we try and weigh that all up. And, and when we present investments for um, investment approval, we, we go before a committee of, of five or six um, very experienced disputes professionals, um, former judges, practising arbitrators, um, and, and then it, it's almost like a dry run. You know, they, they, you know they're, making, they're putting themselves in the shoes of the decision maker as well and um, and, and you know, that there will be debate over not just the legal merit of things, but you know, how um, how the case will be perceived um, more holistically. And, and I think that that's what gets us to a situation where we can try and predict the actual outcome. Um, but we don't always get it right, <laughs> you know. It's, um, you know thing, we, we we get it wrong from time to time, um, and that. That is the difficulty in what we're doing. If if everybody could predict the outcome, then um, they wouldn't need us. You know, people wouldn't need us to help manage the risks, and, and perhaps there would be no disputes because the answer would be would be obvious. Um, you know, so that that's that's how we we approach it. Um, it's uh, it's it's extremely interesting to to sort of step back and try and take a more holistic view of things, and then predicting the outcome isn't just are we going to win or are we going to lose? But, you know, how, the, how is quantum going to be arrived at? You know, how are the experts going to go? Um, what's the right answer on that? And, uh, you know, if we succeed, will we get our cost back? If so, how much? Um, you know, there, there's often a question now around recovery of funding costs as well. And we've had an award um, uh, earlier this year where we were awarded, our, our clients were awarded their funding costs. Um, and, you know, that that's... That, that's quite a discretionary uh, power for a tribunal and, and not easy to predict necessarily. So how do you, throw, just thinking back to the discussion we've had about you know, the slightly opaque world that you have to operate in right now, how do you get this information to, to, to make this holistic decision? How do you get information about the arbitrator and how he's decided in the past, you know, what his inclinations might be. How, how do you go about getting this information? Well, we, we you know, obviously we, we work with um, counsel who are usually experienced counsel um, who will have a view of the arbitrators. Um, our investment management team is, is stacked with, um, you know, former private practice lawyers who worked in the arbitration space. Um, we've got a number of um, people that were at arbitral institutions and, and know very well arbitrators and how they've made decisions. Um, and, you know, we, we have you know, practi a practising arbitrator um, who sits on our committee, our investment committee, uh, and, you know, he has the benefit of, of sitting on tribunals with a lot of um, preeminent arbitrators and, and having insights into the way that they make decisions as well and, and how decision-making works on, on tribunals. So th that, that combination of, of expertise and input helps us make those decisions. Um, and you know, but as I say, it's it, it's more of an art than a science. I think that aspect of it, uh, it, it's it's difficult to predict these things. You also spoke about predicting damages or, or, or quantum. So, do you have quantum experts that that you would that you go and talk to before taking on a case and say, if if you had 
this sort of facts, what would be you know, your assessment? Do you do, do you do that? Yes, yeah, we do. Um, we, we sometimes refer to them as our dirty experts. They, um, they don't appear as independent experts, but they will help us review what the independent experts are telling us. Um, and uh, and we have you know so we have some people with that expertise in house, but we also use um, external parties to help us with that. Um, and and we also look at the data. Um, there is data available on um, you know investor state decisions and ICC um, decisions, looking at the amount of damages claimed versus the amount that's awarded on on average. And we'll always stress test things against that. You know, if, you know, I think the most recent data from uh, investor state cases that that A and O has produced recently um, says that it's about thirty six percent of the, the amount claimed on average that a claimant will receive if they're if they're successful. Um, so when we're looking at an investment, we we might stress test that. You know, if, if okay, we're claiming this, or if we get only thirty percent of that, does this still work for us as a as an investment? Now, before we leave this topic, I have to ask you this question: If you you mentioned that you don't always get it right, so I got to ask you: If you had to put a percentage on it, how often do you get it right, and how often do you get it wrong? Well, we do, we do put a percentage on it, so we have a a, a, a published track record over our history. Um, and it and it moves, but it's between eighty and 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 ninety percent, and it sort of moved between there over the last um, you know four or five years that I've I've been with with the business. Um, but we count in that, and we count as success those cases where we achieve a successful settlement. Um, and uh, you know, if you strip that away and you looked at your know, how often do we get it right if it goes to a hearing. Um, you know, it, it's pretty finely finely balanced. I think we get it right slightly more than we get it wrong for the ones that go go the distance. Um, and you know, that that I think shows the uncertainty that comes with um, you know the binary decision making um, that occurs in in, in disputes. And um, by far and away, you know, our preferred um, outcome is is and most certain outcome is one where there, there is a settlement. So, how many of the cases to, uh, that you handle end up? Being resolved through settlement rather than uh, in an award. Uh, uh, the majority of them do across across the wide, you know, broader portfolio. Um, I don't know the exact um, figure uh, off off the top of my head, but it, you know, it, it is a large majority um, that will go to settlement. And and different jurisdictions are different. Um, you know, we have the settlement rates might be higher in, in some countries than others. There's a there's a cultural dynamic to that. I think. And so th- this takes us, I think, to to the third topic that we're going to talk about, which is mediation as a risk management tool. And it does sound very much to me as if you use settlement mediation as a way of managing your risk. You much much rather settle a case uh, and have the certainty of that of that result rather than taking it all the way. Um, so, well, I'd, I'd add one caveat to that. You know, you you, 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 you set, if you settle fairly and settle well that you know that yes we would rather that um but we you know we we don't encourage settlement where it really undervalues the claim and um, you know you've got to be realistic about that well just on that i, I should mention as well and, I, and i've said this before which is you know even though i for, for all my professional career i've either been a disputes lawyer or now an arbitrator uh, I, I would still say if you can settle the case, you're much better off settling it. You know, even if I'm the arbitrator, even if I think I'm going to get it right, I think you're much better off settling a case if you can, rather than taking it all away. So I understand perfectly why why you would take that view. But in talking about settlement, how do you go about achieving it? Do you is, do you use mediation or is it just over the table negotiation? What's what's your way? What's your view on how to best achieve a good a good settlement? Yeah, it um, it, it's it's a different dynamic for us as as funders. We we don't sort of direct how things should proceed with settlement. Um, you know, we, we do have a say in in, in some cases, um, but more often than not, it's it's client driven. Um, but we always encourage clients to explore it for the reasons you 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 know you you were describing. It's it's far better to be um, to have a settled outcome, have the certainty of that, and um, you know you avoid the 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 risks around binary decision making, but also around enforcement. 
you know, if, if a decision is forced on someone, they're much less likely to comply with it. Um, so we do always encourage it. Um, and it really it depends on the dynamic between the parties, I think, as to whether you're going to have direct negotiations and that result in an outcome or involving a mediator makes sense. Um, you know, if parties are just going to be positional and write um, grumpy letters but you know, through their lawyers, I, I think you know, it's very difficult to achieve a settlement, very difficult to bully someone into a settlement. And it works much better where there is a, a, a mutual desire to try and resolve it, a, a mutual understanding of the uncertainties that both sides face. Uh, and I think mediation can mediation can really help in in focusing both sides' attention on on those uncertainties. Uh, and we do often encourage it. Um, the difficulty is a, a lot of the time one party won't want to suggest mediation to the other because maybe there's a, a sense that it, it betrays weakness and and we often encourage parties to try and build it into their procedures if they're you know if they're designing the procedures in an arbitration say um you know try and include it in the procedural timetable um and you know there are some formal mechanisms of doing that but otherwise you could you could suggest that to the to the arbitrators or at least try and agree it with the other side that you know after we've exchanged the first round of pleadings then we're going to have a go at um at mediating this and then neither party is is sort of coming from a position of weakness having just re received the other side's pleading and, and suggesting it at, at, at that stage um so we do we, we do try and promote it and encourage parties to use it so uh, I'm quite curious as to as things you, you you said one is that you're not you don't get too involved in 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 the settlement process you have a say but what I think what I understood you to be saying is you don't drive the settlement process but you also said that the majority of your cases end up in settlement rather than going to an award so that seems like quite a high percentage to me I mean my own experience and also as an arbitrator and also talking to arbitrators is that we would generally expect 50% of our cases as arbitrator to, to settle. Actually, that there's one statistic that, that, that springs to my mind um, that, that kind of shows that, which is in when I first went, became an independent arbitrator in 2019, um, I had six appointments in six months and I thought, this is great. This is fantastic. It's going better than I thought. Then I had three settlements <laughs> you know, within that period. So, so that's about that. It's about a 50% rate that you're going to get. So when, when you tell me that you more of your cases end up settling rather than going all the way, it sounds to me that's a higher than average um, rate. And, and I'm wondering why is that? Is it because behind the scenes somehow you were encouraging the, the settlement? Well, I, I, my my comment was on a sort of a global basis. Um, I think if we were to narrow down and, and, and look at our arbitration portfolio, I think settlement um, would be much uh, much less, or fewer cases would would settle. Um, I, I do think arbitration sort of moves at a quicker pace, um, and there's perhaps less natural breaks for parties to engage in, in settlement discussions if you're comparing it to say court proceedings where you might have you know a number of you know uh, first instance second instance appeals um and you know slightly longer procedure where maybe um, there's an opportunity to settle and, and courts that might say you really should go off and settle this or um you know court imposed mediation and um, so i think in in, in arbitration it, it, it probably is less often that we are able to settle cases and um, uh, so I, I don't think you can draw a conclusion that because we are encouraging it that, that more cases are, are settling in arbitration at least. Um, you know, I think cases that can be settled um, will be settled if both parties look at it, but a lot of cases just can't be. You know, the, the, the parties are just you know, far too far apart. Um, and But even in those cases, I think it's useful to, to try and engage if you can narrow the issues and, um, you know, if you can reduce the costs in some way um, you know, perhaps if, if the real issue is just about how much is due, not all the liability issues, you, you might be able to cut through that. Um, you know, if you get, you know, if you can get engagement through a mediator. Well, since we've just come off Singapore Convention Week, mm. and, and also, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that, you know, one of the last times you and I met in person was actually when we were both going through the specialist mediator course for yeah. the SIMC. So it'd be interesting to, to just hear from your point of view 
Well, you know, either as a as a specialist mediator or a, as a funder that's been through this process, what do you think? You know, what's your view of of mediation? How, how does how does mediation work as a means of achieving settlement? Uh, well, I mean, I think it can be an, an exceptionally powerful tool, um, but there are there are so many different forms of of mediation and, and approaches of mediators. Um, that you have to get the right sort of mediator for for the the, the, the issue. Um, you know, some mediators might be prepared to to give um, more of a view on on the issues and encourage parties to think about what might be wrong with their case. Some mediators are very much just facilitative, and that might be more appropriate in in, in some cases. Um, you know, where there are commercial relationships that that need to be worked through. Um, but I do think it's a it, it's extremely powerful. Um, I think it avoids uh, both parties um, or one party being upset with the result. Um, although some people say that, that the, the perfect mediation is one where neither side is happy. <laughs> it's, you know, hopefully uh, you, know, you can achieve a result at least that both parties can live with um, and, uh, and can move on and, and, and go to the next thing. Um, it, there's an enormous amount of risk and uncertainty that's tied up with the complex disputes that we get involved in, and um, you know I think it's the better way to 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 resolve things. I would agree with you that probably the the one factor that might make the uh, a difference in mediation would be the mediator, mm. and and the personality of the mediator would be very important because ultimately you know that that's the difference between having a mediation and just sitting across a table with with both parties and trying to hash it out themselves. So that's a real skill in bringing the two together. But it seems to me that it, this might be an even more opaque world than the world of arbitrators. I think it's probably a smaller pool mm. uh, and there's probably less talk and publicity about mediators compared to arbitrators. So how do, how do you go about choosing the right mediator for that for that particular case? So, uh, yeah, well, we, we've had experience with uh, a number of, of mediators and, and um, those that have got the job done for us get, get uh, asked to come back and do it again. Um, it's probably as, as simple as that. Um, uh, you, you know, and it's, um, yeah, it, there is a small pool. I, and I think it will it will hopefully grow, and, and hopefully there will be more transparency around that sort of thing as well, or more knowledge built up around that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's and it isn't just the mediator. I think one of the key factors in a successful mediation is the attitude of the parties coming to mediation, um, and I think you know legal advisors have an enormous role to play there, and um, they have to take their um, advocacy attack hat off and switch into settlement mode um, and, and be objective in the advice that they're giving their clients if, they, if they're going to make the most of that, um, that process. And it's, it, it's interesting in, in some jurisdictions, in, in the states in particular, um, you know, parties to, to very high value um, disputes might have their advocates but have a separate set of settlement counsel uh, who are giving them much more objective advice on the strength of their case um, and, you know, what they should be thinking about with settlement, you know, developing a strategy towards settlement and everything. Um, and it is a very different skill set. Um, I think you know, parties would do well to consider, um, you know, potentially taking a different set of lawyers to their mediation than to their arbitration. Well, it's been a great conversation, Tom, but let me just end off maybe with, with a more personal question. Uh, and going back to you know, the, the experience that, that we shared going through the uh, SIMC course, mm -hmm. has going through that course helped you understand mediation better? Do you think you have a better insight in, into mediation having done that? I, I, I think so. Um, uh, it, it does it does give you insight into it. And, you know, we got to practice being mediators and go through, um, uh, you know, various uh, scenarios. Um, and that it, it does, it shifts your thinking and um, puts you in the mediator's shoes. Um, but there is no, uh, there, there, there's no, it doesn't, nothing can make up for actually just doing it in real life um, and, the, you know, a real life dispute and the issues that are, that are there. Um, and I, you know, I've had four or five mediations over the last year, um, you know, in difficult, complex um, disputes and, and they're hard, they're hard to resolve. 
Um, you know, it's a, it takes a, a, a special effort from a mediator to get one of those across the line, I think. Well, I, I said we'll end with that question, but you raised another point that I'm quite curious <laughs> about, which would be, you, know, you said you don't get too involved in, in the settlement process, but it does sound as if, you know, when there's a mediation, you know, the the investment manager would be there. Is that correct, that you, the investment manager would be would be sitting there throughout the whole mediation? Uh, yeah, typically as, you know, as stakeholders in the dispute, um, we would be there. Um, when I say we don't get you know too involved, we we do have a say. So, you know, cases can't be settled, um, uh, you know, unless we're on board with that. You know, we, we've put a lot of money and investment in, um, and uh, but we don't control that. So, you know, if there's a if there's a difference of opinion and whether a, a settlement offer is fair and reasonable, we have a a, a circuit breaker that that um, takes that to an independent third party. Um, very seldom do we have to use that. Um, you know, our interests are generally aligned with with the clients, and and um, you know we can reach reach decisions that way. Um, but we are we're there. We're there to provide support. Um, sometimes clients like us to be there because they can say, look, you know, I've got my funder. They believe in this case too. Um, you know, we have the funds to see it see it through. Um, so sometimes we you know we're there in that capacity. Sometimes we're asked to say things. Um, you know, in in other cases. Uh, you know, where you, where you might have, um, you know, funding behind one side and insurers behind the other side, you, you've got important third-party stakeholders in the dispute that need to be involved in the settlement discussions. And the me- a good mediator will will engage all of those parties as well as the you know the claimant and the respondent as well. So sometimes, from what you're saying, sometimes you're there more in a sort of a watching brief capacity, but sometimes you actually do. Do get quite rather actively involved in the in the process. Yeah. Yes, and it's you know it depends what what the client wants from us really, and and what the circumstances require. Well, thank you very much, Shama. I think it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for opening up uh, this little window into the world of, of funding, and, and look forward to the opportunity to to continue this discussion with you, perhaps in in person uh, rather than over the over over the screen this time. Well, thank thank you, Stephen. Thank you for inviting me into your home virtually, and uh, it has been a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.